Good evening, everybody. Look at all of you. That's amazing. I think we're dealing, though, with the intelligent crowd this evening, because you all decided to come out to church while it was still warm. So that's, that's awesome. Well, uh, today we're going to look at the, the topic of work, and we're going to be talking about trading our best for God's best, something we've decided to call for purposes of this series, healthy. So what does healthy look like when it comes to our work? So I, I know that Kent greatly appreciates your prayers. Uh, as the father of three young girls, it does seem as if every cold and flu virus known to mankind gets into his house and then eventually into his body. But it is a joy for me to have been able to pick up this sermon topic on short notice. And I mean that because only God could have dropped into my lap the task of giving a sermon on a healthy, biblical view of work. Why? Because standing before you today is a recovering workaholic. In a moment of transparency and confession before you, I declare that I have not always done this well in my own life. Over the course of 28 years working in corporate America and then navigating the vocational change into full-time ministry, I have from time to time, not a, I have allowed work to become far too consuming that I just hear my family scream amen. <laughs> but I want to quickly add that the key word in my self-description is recovering. I am a recovering workaholic. God has been faithful to me, and because I have continually desired to be healthy in my work, he has taught me, molded me, and yes, occasionally kicked me so that I can stand before you this evening as a man with some experience in this matter. My prayer over the past two and a half days has just been that that experience will come to bear and that each of you maybe could walk out of here tonight with something from the practical, from the Word of God, that you can apply to your own life. So we're still in this series of messages called Trading Best, and if you've missed the previous messages, I encourage you to watch them on our website. And if you aren't sure what the series is about, here's the language you've been using to describe it. Being the best employee the best student or having the best marriage, being the best parent or being the top dog at work can put us on the merry-go-round of best. But truth be told, it is often far from a place of joy on that playground. Whatever best is, it isn't easily achievable, sustainable, or definable. Show me someone who is best at anything, and I'll show you someone who is most likely lacks happiness and peace. Best consumes the 18-year-old valedictorian as much as the 52-year-old CEO. No matter our demographic, being best fuels our addictions and our affairs, our dysfunctions and our disappointments, our anxieties and ambitions. Now, to understand God's best for us with regards to work, we need to start early in the Bible. Genesis 2.15 says this, the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. So this is the first time the word work is used and with its connection to what it means to be a human. In this context, humans are called to work. The language here conveys tending, cultivating, and preserving in relation to the physical garden. But the word employed here is the same word you might find today in modern Hebrew to capture the idea of working. It's important to see work as part of our design. We are designed to physically and spiritually work, to tend, to cultivate, and to preserve. What God started in creation, we continue in the garden as well as in our modern world. Whatever you do, it is vital to remember that in all that we do, we represent God in the world and bear his image in it. And as image bearers of God, we are commanded to advance the common good. We are to help other humans flourish, whether they be our humans, our family, or others, our neighbors. We are to bring or preserve beauty and justice in the world. And we are to fulfill our purposes and utilize our gifts well. Now, most of you know the rest of the story. What happened next is that Adam and Eve disobeyed God and they ushered sin into the world. The consequences of this are significant, numerous, and far-reaching. However, today I want to focus on what sin does to our design related to work. 
and we only have to go one more chapter. Genesis 3. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil you will eat food from it all the days of your life. So the word used to begin this sentence is literally the opposite of blessed. It's cursed. It means the removal of God's provision, favor, and blessing. God's blessing is work. Sin's curse is toil. Work serves the noble purpose for which God designed it. But do you know what the definition of toil is? The perversion of that design. It's work removed from God's protection, favor, and blessing. There is a biblical and a realistic, meaning relevant for today, difference between work and toil. Now, we've been myth-busting all throughout this series, each week exposing some myths that we've come to believe about the different topics, and I'm going to do the same today. One huge myth about work is the myth of necessary evil. This is the belief that we work only to get by, just to make it, to provide for our families and make money. And surely those things are realities, but work is not just a necessary evil. And it's certainly not meaningless, at least not by God's design. The truth is that work is meaningful, toil is meaningless. As we mentioned a moment ago, toil can be differentiated from God-ordained work by virtue of the fact that, it, that work is absent God's provision, favor, and blessing. Sometimes we refer to this as the nine-to-five grind. A carefully tended and cultivated and preserved world now becomes cursed. Instead of being tended, it is wild. Instead of being cultivated, it is chaotic. Instead of being preserved, it is decaying. We see this in the world and we see this in our own lives, the difference between work and toil. And it's important to understand it and recognize the differences. Now Solomon was a man who came to understand the difference well. He authored the book of Ecclesiastes and it's one of my favorite books of the Bible. Now just a side note, a little extra here for no charge tonight, not a part of the sermon. But as I was preparing these comments and the phrase, that's my favorite book of the Bible, came out, I realized that about any time I dig into any text, that book happens to be my favorite book of the Bible. Turns out I love the Word of God, and I hope that you do too. And I encourage you that, that as you sit there, like I usually do, that you will be challenged to dig into the text and the surrounding chapters in the Word of God that our teaching team uses in these series. All right, back to your regularly scheduled program. Ecclesiastes is one of my favorite books of the Bible. And here Solomon shows us his understanding of the difference between work and toil. I denied myself nothing my eyes desired. I refused my heart no pleasure. My heart took delight in all my work, and this was the reward for all my labor. Yet, when I surveyed all that my hands had done and what I had toiled to achieve... Everything was meaningless, a chasing after the wind. Nothing was gained under the sun. What does a man get for all the toil and anxious striving with which he labors under the sun? All his days his work is pain and grief. Even at night his mind does not rest. This too is meaningless. Now do you see what went terribly wrong for Solomon here? His work was driven by desire, pleasure, and achievement. His motivation shifted from being God-driven to self-driven, resulting in a life characterized by anxious striving, pain, grief, and many a sleepless night. Solomon leaves God's best behind and tries for his own best. He sets out to make something of his life, and he ends up driving his life into the ground. Then he laments at the end, not because work is meaningless, but because toil is meaningless. And he's missed the meaningful presence of work in his life. Work itself had become a toil. Now the Hebrew word here is hebel. It means empty, vain, unfulfilled, purposeless, or a breath. Now here's where it gets interesting. There's an example of this word being used in Deuteronomy when God is having a bit of a rant through Moses about Israel. And here's what he says. They made me jealous by what is no God and angered me with their worthless idols. So there's the word hebel, translated as worthless. 
God equates hevel with idolatry. And indeed, as Solomon goes on to explain in Ecclesiastes, toil puts us in a place where we end up making an idol of work. We strive to be the best and we get toil. Hevel, empty, vain, unfulfilled. Does that describe how any of you feel about your work? Now, there's another place that this word hebel is used, and it makes another strong case for how we should see the difference of work and toil. It's in Genesis. It's just after the garden, just after the curse of toil, and we see it when Adam and Eve have a son named Hebel. Abel, as we commonly know him, was killed by his brother Cain. Now, Abel worked the fields, and he brought an honorable sacrifice to the Lord. So he's not an example of a life of toil, but he is an example of a life cut short by someone who was toiling. I don't think it's too much of a stretch to say that toil cuts our lives short. Now, we may live many years longer than Abel did, but our lives can look empty, vain, unfulfilled, and purposeless. Now, let me ask you this. Have you ever found yourself being cynical about your work or your workplace or your boss? Surely not. I I know that I'm not anymore. Help me out here, folks. Going back to this idea of Genesis 3, that, that sin brought a curse upon work, we certainly don't have to look very far to see that reality. We encounter and, dare I say, we often exhibit cynicism about work. Consider these quotes from three famous or infamous men. Oscar Wilde said, Work is the refuge of people who have nothing better to do. Bertrand Russell said, One of the symptoms of an approaching nervous breakdown is the belief that one's work is terribly important. And Karl Marx announced, The division of labor within industrial capitalism blunts the worker and renders him as a replaceable cog in an abstract machine instead of a human being capable of defining his own value through direct, purposeful activity. Now, it's interesting that each of these men, by their very own explanation, are not proponents of Christianity. They certainly understand the curse of Genesis 3, but they miss the blessing of Genesis 2. Wild and Russell we can write off as merely cynical, but Marx is a different story. And while it's difficult to find anything to agree with in regards to Marx, his understanding of the meaninglessness he saw around himself was pretty accurate. The idea is that humans, at the cost of advancement and material wealth, can find themselves an alienated laborer, a cog in the wheel of an abstract machine, We see this around the world, do we not? Whether it's in a shop in Taiwan where clothing is made or whether it's an office cube right here in Pittsburgh, many are working but in an alienated way. And it's difficult to find meaning, value, and purpose in it. Marx is philosophically pointing to Genesis 3 and how work can become toil, losing all sight of our calling as humans. But ours, friends, is a life of hope. It's a life of purpose given by God to Adam and Eve in the garden, but reiterated to us later in Exodus 20. Interestingly enough, when God is speaking directly to his people regarding the command to rest on the Sabbath, listen to what he has to say about work. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. There are two things that we ought to note about labor and work as God is talking about it here. First, it is the meaningful work of tending, cultivating, and preserving the creation. Recognize here that God rested on the seventh day not because he was exhausted from his toil. He rested in the joy of work well done done. Do we get that? The patterns of rest in our lives are not intended to be recovery. They are intended to be joyful celebration. And secondly, please note here that the work takes six days. Now, I'm not making any excuses for workaholics in the crowd, including myself. God is telling us here that we are to spend six days working. 
vocational work, kingdom work, God-honoring work, six days. That work, though, includes the business of tending, cultivating, and preserving the creation that you know as your family. And that work includes the business of loving the Lord your God and loving your neighbor as yourself. Kingdom work, God-honoring work, in my humble opinion, does not allow a lot of time for leisure, but it does require rest. And I hope that resonates and makes sense to you. Now, many of the years that I spent working with Eaton Corporation provided me the opportunity to travel, and I got to do some really cool things. In 1990, just six months after the Berlin Wall came down in Germany, signaling the end of the Cold War era, I found myself traveling to East Germany. Now, mind you, I'm just a small-town kid. I'm about six years into my career at this point, and it's the very first international trip I've ever been on. And here I am in the former East Germany, staying at a resort that the former SS troops used to use for their getaways. The task at hand was an analysis of a manufacturing business to determine if we should acquire the company. But what was fascinating was getting to know the people. I found the people who didn't have the opportunity to work rather than toil. Now, they wanted to work, but they worked in a system that could not deliver the parts or materials that they needed in order to complete their assignments. Interesting, is it not, in the light of the comments regarding Karl Marx earlier? He saw the futility of the curse, but without the hope of the blessing, no system can be created to make work meaningful. But the point of telling you this story is to say that I met people who I found to be exactly like me, separated only by opportunity. And as I did my work with the view of tending, cultivating, and preserving, God did a work in my heart. And years later, when my wife and I were beginning the journey of adopting children, a program in Russia was brought to our attention. God had drawn my heart to Eastern Europe already through my vocational God-honoring work and laid the foundation for easily obeying him years later with the kingdom God-honoring work of adopting. And I would submit to you that when you approach work in this way, what some may consider pain and grief can actually be seen as joy. What do I mean by that? Well, I've got a question for you. Have you ever spent a sleepless night because your mind will just not turn off? Have you found yourself just recounting the day's events and being anxious or maybe completely overwhelmed at what's ahead for the next day? I have to admit times in my life when, like Solomon earlier, my anxious striving leads to nights when my mind cannot rest. But there is a better way. Consider the words of Apostle Paul. We put no obstacle in anyone's way so that no fault may be found with our ministry. But as servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way by great endurance in afflictions, hardships, calamities, riots, labors, sleepless nights, hunger, by purity, knowledge, patience, kindness, the Holy Spirit, genuine love, by truthful speech and the power of God. So I can also tell you that like Paul, when I am in that sweet spot of abiding with and serving my God, waking up at night is not restless. It's merely an opportunity to do business with him. And that's restful and that's joyful. So next time, try to embrace your sleeplessness, taking the opportunity to confess your anxiousness and ask God what he wants to accomplish since you're both up anyway. Toil is meaningless. Toil occurs when work becomes a necessary evil. Toil is not God's best, it's our best. We need to trade toil for God's best. Work and work is meaningful. So how do we rediscover what God intended for work? Well, we confront two more myths about it. And the first of those is the myth of the monk. By way of sweeping generalization, the first 1,500 years of Christianity understood there to be two categories of work. There were most people who just worked and survived, but then there were those who were called. And the Latin word for called is vocation. So there is the myth of the monk. Those who work to survive and those who are called who have a vocation. Those precious few who were called 
who had a vocation were called into the priesthood, the nunnery, or the monastery. There was a separation between two kinds of work, the trivial and the supernatural. But of course, that's not a biblical view of work. The Reformation began to recapture the biblical idea of work and confront the myth that the monk or the priest or the nun were the only ones who were called and whose vocation was spiritual. When Martin Luther translated the Bible into everyday German language, his translation of 1 Corinthians 7.20 said, of course in English, let each of you remain in the vocation in which you were called. So the theology was simple, but it represented a huge change in culture. Everyone had a vocation, not just priests, nuns, and monks. This was liberating in Luther's day, but we've been struggling to rid ourselves of this myth ever since. The truth is, we are all spiritually called to a vocation. This takes some reimagining of our roles in this world, and particularly in our workplace, doesn't it? Have you ever considered that your vocation is a spiritual calling from God? Well, personally, I have been called spiritually to two different vocations. Way back when I was in high school, I felt for a brief time that I was being called to be a pastor. And I began exploring that, but for various reasons, it just did not happen. Subsequently, I fell in love with the vocation of accounting. And quite honestly, I forgot about the previous call. It turns out, though, that I in fact had discerned God's calling, but I just wasn't attuned enough to hear the specifics. He wanted me to be a pastor, but not yet. So when I was 26 years old, God got more specific with me regarding the timing of when I would undergo a change in vocation or calling. But he was also less specific about what that vocation would be. I heard from him then, when you are 50, you will do something else. Now, maybe I was supposed to remember the something else, but I didn't. But God did, and here I am. So clearly, I was called to my vocation as an accountant and finance executive, and just as clearly, I'm called to my vocation now as a pastor. The key is contentment where God has you in the now. And that leads to meaningful work, not toil. Luther's word in the, in words in the verse discussed earlier still apply, and here I've expanded the passage in the ESV. Each one should remain in the situation which he was in when God called him. Were you a bond servant when called? Do not be concerned about it. For he who was called in the Lord as a bond servant is a freedman of the Lord. Likewise, he who was free when called is a bond servant of Christ. God is the one who is giving you your calling, and he looks at each of us as unique, exceptional, precious, significant, and free to follow his lead by tending, cultivating, and preserving the world around us. Calling does not have one simple meaning, but has and will continue to mean many things as it is a personal answer of God's voice to us. The accountant, the mother, the business person, the teacher, the student, the garbage collector, and yes, I say even the currently unemployed, should each one think of them as where God has placed them as a spiritual vocational calling. I think when we not only understand but fully grasp and incorporate into our lives this biblical understanding of our work, we will begin to wrestle not with whether or not we are called, but whether or not our, we are being faithful to serve his call at work. Serving God through our vocation is not a duty, it is, it is an incredible privilege. And this moves us into the last myth related to work, and it's tied to a myth we discussed in the first week of this series. We discussed then the myth of performance, and we replaced it with the truth that we have an audience of one. This myth is very related, but it's specific to work, and it's the myth of the promotion. So many work so hard to get to the next level, to have more responsibility, to have more money, to have a better title, only to find out that it's not all it's cracked up to be. Whether it's a move up a ladder or to greener pastures, the promotion consumes, but it doesn't deliver. 
We throw what we believe to be our best at the promotion, but it doesn't bring out the best in us. Maybe we cut some corners or maybe we cut others down. Either way, we're trying to get ahead. Maybe we add so much to our plate that the things that matter most are covered up by our striving. Whether cutting or adding, thinking that the promotion at work or the promotion of ourselves will somehow lead us away from meaninglessness is, to use Solomon's phrase, a chasing after the wind. For most of my corporate career, I lived by the motto that if I worked hard and kept my head down, people would notice and I would get the chance to do more. No need for self-promotion. Most of my career. Only twice did I take action, seeking for a change on my own. Let me tell you the stories, and you decide if in either I was following the path that God would have had in mind for me. The first time I was in a position working directly for a boss I loved. He had been my mentor since early in my career, but shortly after getting into this position, my boss discovered he had cancer, and he passed away very quickly. So my new boss was a former peer who I didn't really have a great relationship with at the time. I stuck it out for a while, but then an opportunity for a promotion came up, and I was pretty sure that I was not going to get that job by working hard and keeping my head down. So I went for it, and I got it. But be careful what you wish for. I had spent the next two years working in the only position throughout all 28 years that I wished I wasn't in. The second time this happened, I was in a job I loved. I was traveling all over the world, and believe it or not, I was pretty good at what I did, and I was making more money than any small-town Nebraska kid would have dreamed. But I had no joy. I was striving. I was chasing the wind, and I was losing my wife and children. Now, we weren't headed for divorce, but we were a long way away from happy, and we were not joyful. So God grabbed my heart, and after a lot of prayer and pride swallowing, I went on the self-demotion path. And God was amazing. Because of his faithfulness and my years of working hard with my head down, literally the moment that I suggested the need to find a position that required significantly less travel and that allowed me to stay in Pittsburgh, my boss practically promised me he would make something work out. And six weeks later, he had restructured a corporate-level department that I could lead. Church, the myth of self-promotion is about us being ambitious for more. And instead, we should be ambitious about faithfulness to our vocation. Listen to these words. Make it your ambition to lead a quiet life, to mind your own business, and to work with your hands just as we told you, so that your daily life may win the respect of outsiders and so that you will not be dependent on anybody. Our lives and our work should be attractive to outsiders. Can I say that again? Our lives and our work should be attractive to outsiders. You would not believe the amazing conversations I got to have with people who were trying to figure out why in the world someone would go after a demotion. And those conversations paled in comparison to those that I had with people when I was explaining that I was leaving corporate America to become a pastor. The world is not attracted to more of the same. They're attracted to an alternative way. So what does ambition for our vocation look like like if it's going to be attractive? Well, as Christians, we do not need to add to the multitudes of people who slog through their workdays, miserable about every new task, every email from their boss, and every paycheck that they think is too small. People are attracted to what is different and admirable. And the way to go about our days, then, should be different and admirable. Our attitude should speak volumes, something like, I'm here doing the same work that you are, and I'm joyful in it because I understand that this work is a gift and the people that I work with are image bearers of God and the work that I'm doing is my intended purpose and the results of my work should be blessings to other people. Now let me be clear, your attitude should speak those words, not your mouths. Remember the famous quote from St. Francis of Assisi, preach the gospel at all times, use words if necessary. Now, additionally, as Christians, this has a direct relationship to our struggles with consumerism. 
That is the need to buy and accumulate stuff. If everyone is toiling to keep up with their lifestyle, which they usually cannot afford anyway, there is something attractive in someone who is simplifying their life and doing so to the glory of God. Again, that's different and admirable. So let's take a look at one of my favorite books of the Bible again, The Words of God Through Solomon. And I saw that all toil and all achievement spring from one person's envy of another. This too is meaningless, a chasing after the wind. Better one handful with tranquility than two handfuls with toil and a chasing after the wind. Solomon, who is famous for asking wisdom from God, is saying that we should stop chasing, stop being ambitious for more just for the sake of more. Instead, we should be ambitious about being faithful with what we have. Now, Albert Einstein, while no Solomon, was a pretty smart guy in his own right. So listen to his advice about leading a more simple life, one where we are strangely content. The trite objects of human efforts, possessions, outward success, luxury, have always seemed to me contemptible. I believe a simple and unassuming manner of life is best for everyone, best both for the body and the mind. Solomon, Einstein, you choose. But both are recommending that we become content with what we have. This is not how our culture normally operates. But a two-handful person must toil, and that's meaningless, a chasing after the wind. A one-handful person can just work, and that's meaningful, and that's what we're called to do, and that's what we should be faithful to. A one-handful person, assuming that they have found tranquility, is healthy, and healthy brings out God's best in us. Well, I want to close with reviewing a scripture that I, I believe is very often misunderstood. Maybe you've read it this way before, and hopefully I can shed a new light on a very familiar passage for you today. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Too often... We look to this verse when we want leisure. I'm tired. I want to stop working. Let me rest. But that's not the intended use of this verse. This is intended to be encouragement for you in your workplace. Can I reread this for you with a little different emphasis? Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. And learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Folks, being in a yoke means work. If you don't know what a yoke is, Google it. Jesus does not say, calm all who labor and you won't work anymore. What he is saying is stop toiling Get into the yoke with me, and when we are working together, you will find rest for your souls. And when you find rest at the soul level, you have found true rest. And that, my friends, is trading best work for healthy work. Would you stand with me and pray? Father God, Thank you for the great privilege it is to serve you. God, I thank you for, just in my own life, the ability to have done that in a secular job and then to do it in in the ministry, Lord. But but not everyone gets to be in the ministry, nor is everyone called to it. God, thank you for these words of encouragement from your son. And I pray, Lord, that as we find ourselves striving in whatever it is that we are doing, that we would be able to to picture ourselves getting into the yoke next to our Savior and seeing that the the road that we are going to plow is so straight and is so easy to do because we're not toiling, but we're working to serve 
to cultivate, to tend, and to preserve the creation that you have blessed us with. Thank you, Lord. Amen.